This is going to be a brief overview and introduction to the tenure and promotion review process, but it will also double as a review process for the annual faculty evaluation. So what I'm going to do is introduce you to the tool that will be used to help you organize all of your teaching materials, your research and scholarship evidence, and also um, some examples of the ways that you have supported the university, your college, your department, and so on. The tool that I'm going to show you is the one that is currently in use. Uh, we've used it the last four years or very close versions of it the last four years. Um, but I'll give the caveat that we may be revising it in the future. If the revision does happen, you'll be given plenty of notification. Um, for the most part, the revisions will have to do with how much weight or how much importance you can assign to various aspects of your evaluation review. So um, as I share this, there are three areas that you will be reviewed on. And so all faculty, no matter what their standing is, no matter what departments they're in or what missions they're serving, will be reviewed on teaching. And that will always be the biggest. Research and scholarship, which can be comparatively high or low, depending on what you choose it to be. And then um, service to the institution. So that can be work in departments, um, student clubs, college service, uh, or university service. So there are a lot of different ways you can serve, such as a, on committees, as a chair of a committee, or supporting a strategic initiative, and so on. The, op the opportunities are really endless. So the tool is organized around those three areas of faculty, um, or of faculty work, and each area has a bunch of different ways to uh, demonstrate the work that you've done. So let's take a look at that. Um, by the way, I'm going to be sharing all of this from the vantage point of someone who's gone through it, but also somebody who served on the 10-year promotion review committee three times, uh, chairing it the last two times in particular. Um, so I've seen a lot of these portfolios, um, preparing one of them myself. So I've seen things that faculty do really well in presenting the work that they've done and things that they do very poorly. So I see what some of the banana peels, if you will, that have tripped faculty up. So the first page is about um, superior teaching indicators. Now without going too far into the university system requirements, what they want to see in order to obtain tenure or promotion is here superior indicators or uh, areas levels of excellence um, which is objectively defined as 85 percent of the possible uh, maximum points possible. Um, so that's a pseudo objective way of doing it but as you'll see, a lot of these will have subjective components. So whether or not um, an innovative teaching practice, for example, is qualifies as an innovating teaching an innovative teaching practice from the vantage point of some of the people who are reviewing you. It may also be helpful to know that you will be reviewed by other faculty in your college. So if you're in the College of Arts and Sciences, for example, that means that you like if you're an art professor, you're going to be evaluated by social science faculty, chemistry faculty, uh, biology faculty, music faculty, um, and, and so on. So if as a psychology professor, I had natural science faculty and humanities faculty evaluating my portfolio, which isn't perfect. If we had a much larger university, you could be reviewed by only people in your discipline, and they'd be able to speak a little bit more to the scholarship that you have. Um, so there's been, I think, a, a bit of an issue with what qualifies as scholarship in the College of Arts and Sciences, and so uh, that's part of the reason for revising the tool in the future. Okay, so let's take a look at this one, um, and I'll do some of the summarizing comments right at the end. So there are, on this tool, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 possibilities for up to 5 points. Um, I think, yeah, five points. And then um, the maximum total is 50. So if you do a little bit of quick math, that means you do not need all of those areas to have, you don't, you don't need evidence for all of these areas. You only need evidence for 10 of them or fewer. You don't need to like reach that maximum point. You need 85% ideally. And so it's conceivable that you only have evidence for eight or nine of these and still get... Um, close to maximum points. All right, so let's take a look at this. This first one is pretty simple. Uh, it, it asks that you've developed a syllabus 
with learning outcomes, with assessments, with content development. In other words, these are the syllabi that you use every semester. Include those in your faculty evaluations or the promotion and tenure evaluation. Simply doing that is like a check mark. If you have, if you te teach five different classes, provide example syllabi for each of them, demonstrating that you've done, you've gone through this process. It's very easy for faculty to just say, I have syllabi and I trust that they're good um, without actually sharing them. So it's tedious. It seems, um, it seems like unnecessary additional work, but it's just holding you accountable and sharing with those who are reviewing you in your college that, yeah, I, I, I have followed the, the instructions for syllabi. Um, so this is one of those that it's like, in my opinion, freebie, freebie points for the review that some faculty just uh, overlook it, I guess. Have you implemented teaching strategies um, that support student learning and are consistent with program goals, curriculum levels, and so on? I've listened to you all discuss um, unique and innovative strategies that you use in the classroom. Some of them worked well, some of them worked poorly. All you need to do is document that. Maybe give an example of a worksheet that you designed. Maybe talk about how you borrowed from the philosophy of education of somebody that you esteem or you admire, and then you designed uh, an, an interactive activity with students. Or maybe you've tried something new in your online course. Whatever it is, document it. Give some examples. Again, what you're doing in this portfolio is giving your reviewers an opportunity to just look briefly inside your classroom to get a sense of the experience that your students are having. Um, give a few of those. Again, that will that will give the impression, that, that will show the impression that um, you're not just following a textbook, for example, um, but, but you have a dynamic exchange with your students. Then there's those dreaded teacher evaluations. You will have to calculate what your average scores are and then um, share those results. So it's a really thick part of your uh, portfolio. Um, if you've been doing annual fac faculty evaluations, you should have uh, records of all of those already. Um, it's always difficult to track those down, so make sure after the semester ends and the, the scores are posted, the, the student evaluations faculty are posted, you save them and keep them in a folder so that when it comes time to, to gather them, you have them. Did you learn and apply multimedia technologies? Chances are, uh, if you've been attending the faculty staff conferences, You've, you've been trained in how to use the True, Trust, True Touch system, how to use Georgia View, how to use interactive activities through smartphone applications and so on. There are hundreds of different digital technologies that you can use in the classroom. Evidently, we esteem that. And so giving any examples of, of what that looks like in your classroom will be helpful. Again, this seems very tedious. Yeah, I use multimedia technology. Yeah, I have syllabi. Yeah, I do innovative teaching practices. But this little small step is still useful to show your colleagues that you have followed through on these. And, and just by showing evidence of that um, is holding you accountable and so that they don't have to, they don't have to guess. Uh, they don't have to imagine that you're doing it. You can actually show them. The same goes for all of these. Notice you do not need to have evidence for each of them. Um, for example, if you haven't gone through the Quality Matters training, that's fine. I've, I've had faculty ask me, like, oh, I, I don't have something for that. I guess I'm not going to get tenure. It's like, yeah, but you have something for all of the other ones. Like, you're going to get more points than, than are possible, um, and so on. Uh, it may look like a lot of things here you don't know about or you're not familiar with. I promise you, within four years, you will be very familiar with all of them, and you have plenty of opportunities to internationalize a course. To receive quality manner, uh, to receive quality manners training, uh, quality not manners but matters training, or to implement and document an instructional an instructional intervention. Um, I feel like I have done all of these. So uh, as you review them and have any questions, please let me know. Hey, what does this one mean? What would an example of that look like? Um, the three year pre tenure review process is, an, is another opportunity for you to get some feedback on what you might include, what you feel like, what they feel like is missing, um, etc. For each of these, there is, again, like I said, a subjective component. That means that if you provide a bunch of information about, let's say, your use of current research in your practice of teaching, what qualifies as five points versus three points versus one point, um, it's going to be up to the discretion of the person looking at your portfolio. So what you can do is give as much evidence as possible pointing towards 
excellent, which would be five out of five points. Um, if you give one kind of paltry example, maybe expect one point for that. Um, but someone might look at that and say, wow, that's really impressive and give you five points. So there is a subjective component, but you can stack the deck in your favor by providing lots of examples. So again, that's teaching, and you decide how many uh, percentage points your teaching score receives. So let's say you get um, 40 out of 50 possible points, and uh, you've assigned 50%. Uh, that would be 90% um, of... 50, right? Yeah, so that would be 40, 40 points total out of 100 for the entire um, for the entire review. So if, if you assign 50% weight to teaching then and you receive a 40 out of 50 in, in terms of points, then you've got 40 points moving forward and you still have opportunities to get up to 85 points between the next two. So there's a little bit of math that goes into it, but um, and, and the math always confuses everybody. Um, so hopefully in the future, there's a little simpler way to do it. All right, moving on to research and scholarly indicators. Um, this is one that I like to make as big as possible because I publish a lot, and so I want to receive maximum percentage points for it. Um, but some people publish little or nothing, and so they want to receive as small a percentage. And uh, this is one of the light areas with a lot of the portfolios that we've reviewed. And so some people have published nothing, and they've presented nothing at conferences, They've attended conferences, but they haven't, they haven't publicized the work that they're doing. And so that's why one of the um, workshops that I've done in the past has been faculty uh, scholarship of teaching and learning. So you're already teaching in a classroom. You know what seems to work, what doesn't work. By providing an analysis of that and sharing the practices that you use and how they work out, that's scholarship of teaching and learning, and you can share that with other people so they can benefit from your experience. You have lots of experience, and you can turn that into uh, research productivity. You can turn that into scholarship and really support your uh, teaching community, other people who teach the same classes. Um, so if you, if you want some ideas of how, how to participate in research or develop your scholarly resume, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to do that. One of my problems with this is that uh, there's a maximum to how many points you can receive. So for example, you get 10 points for a book uh, and for a maximum 15 points. So if you've published one book and one article in five years, you can only get 15 points. So that's the maximum. Well, when I was going in, I had three books and about 12 articles, and I couldn't receive uh, however many points that would be, probably like 75 points. I was limited to 15, even though I thought I had produced quite a lot in terms of scholarship, but I was limited. So um, one thing this tool does is encourage you to be as diverse as possible with your activities. So publish one book, publish a few articles, give some presentations, do some applied research. It's like a little bit of everything. Apply for a grant, uh, maybe receive a grant. You have opportunities for each of them. If you are in the, um, the humanities or applied arts, um, you may have an opportunity to conduct a recital or to organize an art exhibit or give a performance or maybe, um, I, I don't know, like become a humanities scholar. Um, I, I'm not very familiar with the, the various forms of this, but there's always a way to make a case for the work that you've done being contributions to your field. Include that in your portfolio and let your reviewers know where to put that. Um, where what that qualifies for and you'll notice down here at the bottom there's the opportunity to do uh, to add something that doesn't fit so maybe you've done something that, that doesn't land in one of these categories the same option was in the teaching so maybe you did something that doesn't fit in one of the categories you can you can apply it there um, really quickly uh, publishing um, submitting grant proposals having the qualifications to be a graduate instructor um, and you can find those in, on the Graduate School website. Um, applied research, uh, presentations at professional meetings, um, attending and participating in a conference about scholarly knowledge as opposed to participating in a conference about teaching and instruction, which would go under the teaching um, area of the portfolio. If you're pursuing a graduate degree or another graduate degree, you can get some points in that area. Um, or receiving an award like a, a faculty of the year award for teaching in, or for teaching or research. And so that would go, I guess they, they put all of those right here, which is, I guess, a bit of a head scratcher. 
anyway, this is one of the areas that, like I said earlier, is, that is the weakest. And so, according to the USG, um, and we're kind of fighting this, I think, um, in academic affairs, and, and we're divided about that, um, there's an argument that faculty should be able to obtain tenure without any research or scholarship. And so there's some language out there that if you have teaching and service and no, no research that you should still be eligible. Um, and I think there's some, and actually, yeah, if you, if you make 15% here and get zero points, you would still get 85% overall. But according to the USG, you have to have something in all categories. And so that's a, that's a discussion that's ongoing. So keep that in mind. Finally, finally um, service to the institution. This is divided up into service to the university. So this might be a university-wide initiative. Uh, the college, so supporting college committees and college uh, plans. Um, and then your department. And then any other intercollegiate uh, activity. Not inter, intra-collegiate activity. Um, keep track of the committees that you're on. I, at one time, I was on 12 different committees, and I forgot which ones I was serving on. And so it's useful to like keep notes, keep meeting minutes, uh, keep any sort of uh, work that you've done as part of the committee with your name on it. Keep copies of those just so you remember what committees you've served on. After four or five years, it's easy to forget. Um, and these add up pretty quickly. Notice also on here, there's like sponsoring a student organization or conducting workshops. You'll have plenty of opportunities to do both of those, especially if you become friends with Dr. Medlin, uh, Dr. Hatch, so, so, or, or your college dean, um, or the provost and the associate provost and so on. If you make friends with them, you'll have plenty of opportunities to support all of these missions. Okay, um, this is the same kind of weights as the research. So if you focus a lot on research and not so much on institutional service, make research 35% and service 15%. Or if you do both, make them both somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and if you do both of them very well, maybe make them high, make teaching lower. It's entirely up to you the way you divide up those percentages. You can calculate what the overall score would be based on your own um, assessment of the materials that you provide. Um, so that you get the best score possible. I mentioned the subjective component. Um, here is the breakdown for the number of points that something might receive, but again, all of those, whether it meets criteria, fails to meet criteria, exceeds criteria, that's going to be subjective and in the perspective of the reviewers. The last thing I want to say is when you're going up for tenure and promotion review, from the reviewer's perspective, it's very clear who is ready for it and who has put the work in and who is serious about it and then who is not. So you can almost see just on the size of the portfolio. And so some people submit double portfolios that are like this thick and so it's like this much material. Yeah, that's a lot to look at, uh, but it's all organized really well because what they want to do is make sure that the reviewers know the work that they put in. Not put in to make the portfolio, which of course took a long time, but that resembles the work that they've done for the university and for their professional fields. And so it's all cataloged, it's all in order, it's very easy to like page through it and you know what everything stands for. And it's clear that this person knows that they have met all of the standards or they've exceeded all of the standards. It's, very, it's abundantly clear. You can almost see within seconds the difference between these two portfolios. The other portfolio, by comparison, looks like it was kind of a folder with just a bunch of stuff, st or a bunch of materials stuffed into it, not in any particular order. When you pick something out, you're not sure what it's supposed to stand for you, so you have to look at the tool and kind of guess, is this supposed to be for teaching, or is this for research, and what aspect of research is it? Um, again, that's very different from flipping to a page and knowing because it's been cataloged and it's identified and there's a little description, you know exactly what it stands for. Um, so I recommend being the example of um, being highly organized and uh, very carefully prepared because this is something that you don't want to have to do a second time. Um, and I've seen many people that have had to do it a second time, unfortunately, even though I knew that they had put in a ton of work in their job they just failed to follow through on this admittedly tedious step. So, so don't be that person. Um, 
Please reach out to me if you have any other questions or if you come across something that you're not sure about or you're still uncertain about the whole process or you're worried about meeting one of the uh, goals. But your chair is also there for you to help or there to help you. Your dean wants you to succeed. Um, I, I promise you, people are not trying to snipe you down. Uh, we want to see faculty stick around. We want to see people who are great in the classroom do great things outside of the classroom too. And there are plenty of opportunities. So please reach out. Um, and then let me know if, if uh, you felt this, this was helpful or if there's something else that I can focus on in a subsequent video.